Okay, this is an incredibly important question. And what we do with Jesus will ultimately determine whether we spend eternity with God in heaven or whether we spend eternity separated from God, receiving his wrath in, in the lake of fire. Well, we need to understand what it does not mean. And there's a lot of confusion about this. People believe if they're religious, if they go to church, if they pray a prayer, if they confess Jesus as their Lord, if they make some kind of commitment to follow Christ, if they confess their sins on a daily basis, if they go to church, if they've been baptized, if they've been confirmed, if they do these things, they have received Him, He receives them because of the things they've done. But the fact is the Bible doesn't teach that. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells us that there will be a day when many people will confess, Lord, we did many wonderful things in your name. And he will say, depart from me, I did not know you. You see, these people knew who Jesus was. And these people claimed to do the things that they did in his name, for his honor, for his glory. It is not by knowing who Christ is that we receive him. We need to know who he is in order to receive him. But that is not how we receive him. It is not by doing something good for God that makes him happy with us. Well, there are four things that I want to emphasize today. First of all, we have to receive as true who Christ claimed to be. John is very clear in John chapter 1 who Christ is. John sets out the entire book, laying it out in a logical progression so that we will see who Christ is, we will receive that as true, we will believe on him. The second thing we must receive as true is what Christ came to do. Christ did not just come to perform a bunch of miracles and tell people, I want to help you get to God. Christ came to die as our sin bearer. That's why John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus represented a sinless sacrifice who would die in the place of the sinner so that God could punish him in our place. God's wrath, His justice would be satisfied in Christ. And we could be completely pardoned, completely forgiven. He came to present an acceptable righteousness to the Father because all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what Jesus came to do. In the Gospel, we have a cross with a sinless Savior dying in your place and in mine. In the Gospel, we have God and man in one person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, dying on the cross in our place. In the gospel we have an empty tomb, a risen Savior. We must receive as true what Jesus said about himself, what John records about Jesus, and what Jesus did and why he did it. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But there's another element to this. We must recognize and embrace as true what Christ says about us. Jesus says that apart from him, there is no salvation. He came to die for who? For sinners. He says those who do not believe on him are condemned already. We are sinners according to Christ. We are condemned according to Christ. We are with any, without any hope apart from Christ. Jesus said, unless you become as a little child and are converted, you will by no means enter the kingdom. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Until we recognize ourselves as spiritually bankrupt, we cannot and we will not receive Christ depending exclusively upon his person and work. So re receiving Christ means receiving as true who Christ was. Receiving as true what Christ came to do and why. Receiving as true who Christ says that I am. And depending exclusively on the person and work of Christ. That is what faith is. Faith is a decision based on what God says in his word in the gospel. To turn from all other hopes to depend exclusively upon the sacrifice of Christ the person of Christ and the righteousness of Christ as my one and only hope of standing before God. Think about it. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, The things that were counted as gain to me before my conversion, the fact that I was a Pharisee, the fact that I was a Jew, 
The fact that I was blameless in the eyes of those around me in keeping the law, these things I counted as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. I count them as dung that I may win Christ. Why? So that I will be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is by the works of the law, but the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. He says the same thing in Romans chapter 3. He says the righteousness of God that comes apart from the law is revealed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. He says we are justified freely by faith through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He says it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, it's according to his mercy he saved us. He said it's by grace that we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. I have a question for you today. Have you received Christ? Is He alone the object of your faith? His work, His righteousness, His sacrifice, is that the object of your faith? Or is it something small that you have done that you believe merits your way to God? Receiving Christ is not about what we do for God. It's about depending upon what He has done for us and nothing else. I like what the hymn writer says. He says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Is Christ your only hope? Or are you depending on something else?